Hello everyone, my name is Albert Świdziński. I'm the Director of Analysis at Strategy and Future, and we are here at the sidelines of Warsaw Security Forum. And with me today is uh, Lieutenant General Ben Hodges. Uh, thank you for being here with us today, General. Thank it's you. A, it's a great honor. And earlier today, there was a session devoted to issues of military mobility. And uh, the session proves that uh, that the current, the recent current, over the last couple of years of a uh, great amount of, of talk and political debate and diplomatic talk about uh, the issues related to military mobility uh, is still continuing. Would you say, General, that all those words have been matched by deeds so far? So, uh, military mobility is essential for deterrence. We have to demonstrate that we can move as fast or faster than Russian forces so that they don't make a mistake of thinking that hmm, we could probably attack Poland or Lithuania or Romania before the alliance could respond and then undermine the cohesion of the alliance. Mm -hmm. So that this is about deterrence, it's about giving our political leaders options other than a liberation campaign. That's, that's why it matters. This is not to make it easier to do exercises, for example. This is about giving political leaders an option other than a liberation campaign. Um, I will say that uh, I was naive in the beginning. Um, I didn't realize the critical role that the European Union should have. And when we think about the challenges of military mobility, uh, there's the legal diplomatic component, there's a capability component, and there's a capacity component. The EU clearly is the right institution to uh, address crossing borders with so-called war materials. Um, there are literally hundreds of laws that have to be changed when you add together all the nations that we're talking about to include Poland, Germany, Lithuania, Romania, and so on. Um, and the EU has, has taken this on. I'm, I'm actually, while I'd like to see it go faster, uh, I think an institution like the European Union is in fact committed to getting, to getting this right. The fact that they've created uh, one of the 17 PESCO projects is about military mobility uh, gives me uh, some uh, encouragement. We're trying to create the effect of a military Schengen zone. The military needs to be able to move inside Europe the way tourists do or, or uh, merchant vehicles do. The uh, capability part is we're really talking about bridges, uh, tunnels, uh, rail infrastructure, rail heads that allow rapid uh, unloading of armored vehicles, for example, airports, seaports that are able to handle rapid reinforcement. And uh, the uh, Solidarity Transport Hub, frankly, uh, that Poland is working on uh, is an excellent example of a nation uh, it, that's trying to fill a capability gap. I think that's very important. Uh, when you think of how many rivers there are, when you cross the Oder River from Germany uh, into Poland to get to Tallinn, uh, there are eight major rivers that are the size of the Oder or the Vistula and then hundreds of other water bodies. There are not enough bridges that can um, handle heavy uh, equipment. Um, so uh, investment there I think is important. And then the third component is capacity. We've got rail but not enough rail to move armored forces fast. Uh, so trying to find ways to uh, encourage nations to invest in rail capacity that will move uh, several brigades, armor brigades simultaneously uh, is an important part of deterrence as well. We're not moving out as fast there as I think we need to. Great and the last again two or three years um, brought an increase in investment in dual use infrastructure, or transport, uh, transport infrastructure in general and this is uh, the Solidarity Transport Hub, which you have mentioned, which will be a multi multimodal transport node. And again, connecting rail and airport infrastructure in, in, in one. But this is also, in a way, complemented, creating, I would imagine, a synergistic effect with other investments of the TSI, such as uh, Via Baltica, which I would imagine be very, could be very important, going deep into the Baltic states. And then there is the Via Carpatia, and there is also the, oh, I'm not sure how very developed this pro project is, but of connecting the port in Gdańsk to a port in, on the coast of Romania, uh, of Constanza. That is correct. 
Do you view those, if they are taken together, first of all, do you think we can consider them, from the military standpoint, we can consider them as a, as a singular, singular network, uh, potentially? And how do they change the strategic outlook on NATO's eastern flank? Mm. Well, again, this is about deterrence. Um, to, to be able to move as faster, faster than Russian Federation forces could move, to be able to communicate to them, you know, do not make a mistake. We, we see what you're doing, and we are able to move as fast or faster than you are, Kremlin. So that, that's why the infrastructure you just talked about is really important. Right now, it is very difficult, frankly, to move by rail and even by highway from the north flank of NATO to the southern flank of NATO. Part of that is because things like the Carpathian Mountains obviously present a real obstacle. Uh, but also, uh, the, the rail infrastructure has not been developed over the past, since the time of the Habsburgs, uh, was not developed to enable rapid movement. Um, and where I think, when I think about Poland, where it sits, if I'm in Poland and I'm looking east at Russia, being able for the alliance to move laterally up into Lithuania, for example, uh, Latvia and Estonia, or to move south into uh, Romania and Bulgaria, that lateral movement is really important. So the, uh, the rail networks that you talked about that would connect the Baltic states, uh, Gdansk, the Solidarity Transport Hub, then down to Constanza, um, that would be a significant improvement in capability of the alliance to move fast, as fast or faster than Russian Federation forces could move. And we have to be able to demonstrate that. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe that any infrastructure that has demonstrated dual-use capability, that nations, they ought to get credit towards their 2% on doing that kind of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Or uh, making more rail cars available, for example, on, on 72 hours notice to, uh, to commit to be able to move an armored battalion anywhere uh, in Europe. That, that's a different business model, but we can incentivize businesses to do that, uh, and that should count towards 2%. And I think you famously once stated that creating um, better infrastructure could prevent Russians from hoping to achieve a fait accompli in the eastern flank. Do you think there is any, do you think that is the most important thing, more important, for example, um, increases in military expenditure and buying military hardware? Would, would you prioritize one over the other? Well, uh, the Alliance um, has uh, capability requirements and it's reached out to all the member states uh, to, to fulfill certain things. I would say we need more German trains, not more German tanks. I mean, for sure, Germany, the size of the Bundeswehr is probably about right, in, at least in terms of land forces. Uh, and Germany should continue to invest in the, in the readiness of what they have, but instead of pressing Germany to grow the size of the Bundeswehr, why not incentivize them to uh, pr produce more rail capacity that the Alliance can use and make it, make it available. You know, during the Cold War, uh, when I was a lieutenant in Germany, Germany was on the front line. The inner German border between East and West Germany, Warsaw Pact, NATO, it was a frontline state and it, had, and it needed uh, 12 divisions. Today they're a thousand kilometers away from the front. So having large German military formations is less important, I think, for deterrence than having a transportation infrastructure that is protected against cyber attack as well as against missile strikes. That is what we need, I think, Western Europe uh, to provide. Uh, so that we can uh, demonstrate to the Russian Federation that we are prepared. If they look at us and they see only tanks or only combat formations and they don't see logistical infrastructure behind it, then they know that we're not serious. Mm -hmm. But if they see a solid uh, foundation of logistical infrastructure with real capability that can move quickly, um, I think that significantly improves the uh, deterrence effect that we're trying to achieve. And then one final question is um, concerns the future of the NATO and the ways to rejuvenate the alliance, give it, give it a, a new dynamic. There was some talk about uh, NATO becoming involved in the Pacific Ocean. Do you think, do you think uh, this, is a, this is a viable strategy and do you think that's a way to, 
reinvigorate the, the alliance? So I, I challenge the premise of your question. We don't need to reinvigorate the alliance. I'm, I've been in a NATO soldier now for, I was a NATO soldier for 37 years. Uh, it's as alive now um, uh, as, I've ever, as I've ever seen it. Uh, so it doesn't need to be rejuvenated. Um, there is a sense of urgency, I think, um, in the United States uh, and in, in other parts that uh, because of the very, very strong likelihood of a kinetic conflict with China, maybe even in the next 10 years, uh, and because the United States does not have the capability, capacity to continue deterring Russia, be in a fight against China, uh, fight against ISIS uh, in the Middle East, and then everything else that we're trying to, that we're required to do, you know, freedom of navigation in Straits of Hormuz, uh, and, and uh, soon have to challenge for freedom of navigation on the uh, northern trade route across the Arctic. We don't have enough. Even with the j biggest defense budget we've ever had, there's not enough ability and capacity to do that. So to strengthen the European pillar so that Europeans can, can take on more responsibility uh, to include freedom of navigation missions if the United States becomes distracted by uh, Chinese uh, action in the Pacific. Now, I, by the way, I hope I'm wrong, but as I watch what's happening, I think we're on a trajectory that in 10 years we're going to be in a kinetic conflict, ships, missiles, planes, with China, based on the language coming out of there and the, uh, uh, the militarization of the, all these islands in the South China Sea. I mean, everybody in this room, everybody that's going to watch this video has something that came on a boat through the South China Sea. Uh, and the Chinese want to militarize that and control that and we're not going to allow it. Um, now, should NATO be doing something in the Pacific? I, I would expect to see allies like the British Navy, the, uh, the Royal Navy, the French Navy, maybe others help with freedom of navigation missions in the, in the South China Sea. But really, uh, they could take on the freedom of navigation in the Straits of Hormuz, for example. I mean, you know, the deputy commander, uh, military commander of Iran yesterday said, we now, Israel needs to be wiped off the map, and we now have the ability to do it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's about as threatening a statement as anybody could make. So there are all these threats out there, and I think the alliance has a lot to do to maintain security and stability in Europe and in the Middle East um, mm -hmm. if the U.S. has to get involved in the Pacific. Thank you for the conversation, General. Mm -hmm.